Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Perch from the Wyoming Tribune Eagle. This week, we are talking about the elections as the August primaries are coming up soon on August 20th. So we're going to bring you a roundup of all of the local and statewide elections and uh, the important races and what to know about those before you uh, fill out your ballots on August 20th. But before we get into that, let's get a quick local news roundup. I'm joined here by Ivy Seacrest and Hannah Shields, reporters here at the Wyoming Tribune Eagle. And Ivy, there's a local swim club is making a splash in the news. What's going on there? Absolutely, Noah. Yeah, so basically, um, back earlier this year, the Capital City Athletic Swim Club filed a lawsuit against Laramie County School District. And the important thing to note about this lawsuit is that it's all about feats. Basically, the swim club um, has been being charged $37.50 an hour per their use of the pool, uh, a policy that was reinstated in 2021, and a policy that the school district didn't really have prior to 2021, or at least it wasn't actively being enforced. Um, Both sides had their opportunity to speak in front of uh, Judge Peter Froelicher today, and he basically decided that he was going to vacate the trial, meaning they wouldn't hold a formal trial and he would file his written decision. Really, the entirety of the swim club's argument hinges on this policy from 1998, uh, claiming that any adjustments to the policy after 1998 aren't valid um, because they were made by the administration, not the school board. And so really, it's going to come down to whether or not Froelicher kind of sides with that argument. Thanks, Ivy, for that. Now, Hannah, there's been some drama with the voting machines this week. What's going on there? So it all started uh, with the voting machine test performed by the Laramie County clerk on Monday morning of last week. And basically what happened is the Laramie County GOP chairman, Taft Love, noticed during the voting test that um, the test ballots that were fed through the machine had the same number of votes for each candidate. And under Wyoming statute, it requires that there needs to be a different number of votes for each candidate just for verifying purposes. So Taft Love told uh, Laramie County Clerk Deborah Lee about the issue. And uh, she said she would try to reach out to the voting machine company. Um, but on Tuesday morning, she said she hadn't heard back from them and she won't be able to get to it until next week. So that was what prompted Love to file a complaint with the Secretary of State's office, which led into an investigation performed by our district attorney um, to see basically whether or not like Laramie County would just do another test of the voting machine before the upcoming primary election on August 20th. However, a couple of days later, the state's GOP took it a step further and decided to file a lawsuit against Laramie Laramie County Clerk Deborah Lee. And uh, what the chairman of the Wyoming GOP, Frank E. Thorne, told me last week was that this, what he said was a flawed voting machine test, um, only spreads further public mistrust of using these machines to count votes during our elections. And that what he said would be the only outstanding option is to just switch to a hand count vote. However, Platt County Clerk Malcolm Irvin told me last week that the likeliness of Laramie County switching to a hand count vote this close to the primary election is basically zero. So basically, fast forward on to Thursday, Deborah Lee finally released a statement and she claimed that there were no errors during the voting machine test and that the lawsuit initiated by the Wyoming GOP with the Laramie County District Court only aims to disrupt the election process. So the latest updates that we've seen so far this week is uh, yesterday on Tuesday, the Laramie County did perform another test of their voting machines, and we haven't heard any updates yet on the lawsuit on where that's going. So, But as far as we know, there has been another test of the voting machines, which Taft Love told me would likely happen uh, before the primary election. Thanks, Hannah. And be sure to check out her story online or in print to learn more about that, as well as Ivy's story about the local swim club. And now with election day less than a week away from us, we're going to run through some of the top elections to follow 
locally, statewide, and nationally for Wyoming. So let's start there. Hannah, federally, what are the elections going on here this year? So this year, both U.S. Senator John Barrasso and U.S. Representative Harriet Hageman are up for re-election. Uh, U.S. Senator Cynthia Lummis is not up for re-election this year. So as far as the U.S. Senate race goes, uh, U.S. Uh, Brasso is the incumbent currently, and he faces two Republican challengers, John Holtz and Reed Rasner, both of which um, he'll be up against in the upcoming Republican primary election. Uh, U.S. Representative Harriet Hageman also has a Republican challenger, Stephen Helling. So what this, so how these races will be decided is closed uh, primary election. The Republican seat with the top vote will move on to the general election and face against their Democratic opponent. Both races do have one Democratic challenger. So the top uh, Republican from the U.S. Senate race will face against most likely uh, Scott Morrow, who is a Democrat. Um, he's basically the shoe-in for the Democrat Party, unless there are enough write-ins um, to challenge him. But most likely it will be Scott Morrow that they'll be facing against in the general election. In the U.S. representative race, um, you have Kyle Cameron so far as the sole filed uh, Democratic challenger for that seat. Mm -hmm. And in these races, in all races that are partisan in Wyoming, per state legislation, this will be the first election where you have to vote in the party that you're registered for and you can't uh, do any cross-party voting. So that's important to, n to note as we run through these. Now, statewide, Hannah, there's a lot of elections. What are the top ones to follow for these primaries coming up? So we definitely have a lot of local statewide races um, that Laramie County residents uh, will have an interest in. And so I will go ahead and I'll start with the Senate races. So we have three uh, seats uh, for the state senate that will pertain to Laramie County voters depending on which district that you live in. Definitely make sure to go on the Wyoming Legislature's website, see which district you reside in, and know who the candidates are that you're going to be choosing from. So as far as Laramie County voters are concerned, uh, we have Senate Districts 4, 6, and 8. However, Senate District 6 is going to be the only one and that's going to be relevant to the primary election. In Senate District 4, that is currently represented by Republican State Senator Tara Nethercott, uh, who's from Cheyenne. She did have a Republican challenger, Greg Smith, um, but just a few weeks before the primary election, he did drop out without explanation. So basically what that means is Senator Nethercott will most likely end up winning the ticket for that seat. Uh, since there are no Democratic challengers for that seat as of yet, of course, you never know, um, depending on the amount of write-ins during the Democratic uh, primary. Um, but most likely, it looks like Senator Nether Nethercott will just be running unopposed in the general election. Uh, for Senate District 8, um, that was previously held by Senator Afi Ellis, who is also from Cheyenne. Uh, but she announced earlier this year that she will be retiring for the Wyoming legislature. So in her stead, uh, we have Representative Jared Olson, who's also from Cheyenne, and um, he gave up his house seat and threw his name in the ring to run for a seat in the Senate, in Senate District 8. And he is the sole Republican challenger in that race. Um, there is a Democratic challenger in that race as well, who's going to be Marguerite Herman. So as things are looking right now, if there are no write-ins after this primary election, both Olson and Herman will be facing each other off in the general election. So that leaves us with Senate District 6. And that is definitely one of the most crowded races across the state this year. So we have six challengers, all Republican, racing for that seat. Uh, the seat was uh, previously held by Senator Anthony Bouchard, who is also from Cheyenne. Uh, but he announced in May that he will not be seeking re-election. In his stead, he did endorse one of the candidates, Darren Smith, um, to take over that seat. Uh, Darren Smith had also received an endorsement from former President Donald Trump, which is a bit unusual. Um, I don't know if Trump has ever endorsed a candidate for a statewide race before. Usually you would see that kind of thing happen with our federal races um, but it did happen. It was posted on his Truth Social that 
Trump endorsed Smith, so that's two endorsements for Smith that are definitely worth noting. Um, but that isn't to say that all the other candidates in the race didn't have at least one endorsement from a grassroots organization. So outside of Darren Smith, um, who, like I said, was endorsed by both Bouchard and Trump, you have the five other Republican candidates. And those are going to be Mark Toriani, who is a rancher from Pine Bluffs, Kim Weathers, CEO of a Cheyenne Credit Union, Eric Johnston, a Wheatland farmer, Taft Love, who is chairman of the Laramie County GOP, and Gary Bjorkland, who is a retired veteran and small business owner. There are no Democrats uh, so far filed for this seat. Um, So most likely the seat for Senate District 6 will be decided in the Republican primary. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Now in the House elections, what are those looking like? So we have quite a few House district races as far as Laramie County voters are concerned. Again, you'll want to check on the Wyoming Legislature's website just to double check which district you're living in and um, if your representative is going to be up for re-election. However, with the House districts, they're always going to be up for re-election. So just, just checking which one is representing you and who their challenges are. As far as the House district races go, all of them have at least one Republican challenger. Um, so we don't have time to go through all of them, but we can talk about some of the more interesting ones. For example, we have House District 9, which is currently represented by Representative Landon Brown, who is a Republican from Cheyenne. And uh, he is faced off with by the challenger, Exy Brown. There was a third Republican challenger, Perry Hagelson, who dropped out of the race. Uh, he told one of our reporters last night, um, that he dropped out because uh, there's agreement between him and Exy that they both want Landon Brown out of the seat. So he decided to drop out of the race and give those votes to Exy Brown and support him. So next we have House District 11. That was a seat that was formerly represented by Representative Jared Olson, who's a Republican from Cheyenne. Um, but he is right now eyeing that one seat in the Senate. So uh, we have two Republican challengers for that seat. We have Seth Olvestad and Jacob Wasserberger. So um, there are two Democratic challengers for House District 11. Uh, One of them to know is Sarah Burlingame. She used to be a representative of House District 44. Uh, However, she lost her reelection to Tamara Trujillo in 2022. So now this year, uh, she is running for House District 11, and she will be facing the other Democrat in the race uh, this upcoming primary election, which is Teresa Wolf. So speaking of House District 44, as we mentioned earlier, that seat is currently being represented by Tamara Trujillo, who is a Republican from Cheyenne. This year, she has two Republican challengers for that seat. One of them is her cousin, John B. Romero Martinez, and the other is Lee Filer. Uh, One interesting thing to note about Lee Filer is that he has previously ran as a Democrat in earlier races. In 2020, he ran as a Democrat in the race for House District 12 against Clarence Stivar and lost against him. So this year, Lee Filer is running for House District 44 as a Republican. And again, that race will most likely be decided in this upcoming primary election. So the last interesting race of no is probably going to be House District 43. That is the seat that is currently held by Representative Dan Swanitzer, and he has a Republican challenger, Ann Lucas. Uh, And the one thing to note about Ann Lucas is that she was endorsed by the Wyoming Freedom Caucus. Um, So that is definitely one of the seats that a lot of people are going to be keeping an eye on this year, just in regard of how many seats the Wyoming Freedom Caucus is going to gain after this election. And real quick for our listeners, what is the difference between the Wyoming Freedom Caucus and the Wyoming Caucus? So the Wyoming Freedom Caucus was officially formed in 2022. That was the year that Harriet Hankeman uh, beat Liz Cheney uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, And so after the Wyoming Freedom Caucus was officially formed and really started to gain traction, uh, we also have a group of moderate Republicans in the House, in the state's House of Representatives. 
um, and they do not align their views with the Wyoming Freedom Caucus. So they formed their own caucus, which is called the Wyoming Caucus. Thank you, Hannah. I appreciate you bringing us the latest on those elections. Yeah, no problem, Noah. So in turn now, what are some of the local races that we should be keeping an eye on in the primary? Yeah, uh, I've been following these elections for a bit now. For the upcoming primaries, the Laramie County Board of County Commissioners is a pretty crowded election this year. There are two seats available out of five uh, seats on the board, and uh, there are seven candidates who are seeking those two seats. So they're all seven running as Republicans. What happens is the top two will be nominated for the general election in November, and then the top two vote getters there will be appointed to the board. So most likely, whoever wins the two seats at the primaries this week will become the next county commissioners. The only difference is if a Democratic candidate uh, received at least 25 write-ins and accepted that nomination, then they would be going up against uh, these two Republican candidates in the November general election. But if that doesn't happen, then whoever wins next week will be the next county commissioners. So those seven candidates for county commissioner are Don Hollingshead, who has served most of his career with the Laramie County Sheriff's Department, Kathy Shigliano, who has served as the chapter chair for Laramie County Moms for Liberty, Ty Zwanitzer, who works as an engineer for Cheyenne Fire Rescue, Austin Rodemacher, who founded the Cheyenne Youth Lacrosse Club, Larry Milborn, who works for the Laramie County Fair and Laramie County Events Department, Jess E. Ketchum, who is the administrator of Wyoming State Budget Department, and Josh Tuttle, who we have yet to get a hold of, so I'm not exactly sure what he does. And for the Laramie County Assessor, is the incumbent is Todd A. Ernst. He is running unopposed as a Republican, so he will likely win that seat. And as far as the municipal elections go, uh, incumbent Mayor Patrick Collins, his seat is up for re-election for another four-year term. He faces five opponents in this nonpartisan race. That includes Rick Coppinger, who was the runner-up in the 2020 mayoral election, who lost to Patrick Collins. It also includes Buddy Tennant, Justin Nadeau, Jenny Hexenbaugh, and Victor Miller, who is running as an AI candidate, or rather as a meat avatar, what he calls himself, with the, the candidate promise to use AI for all of his decisions if he were elected to office. And in those seats, the top two vote getters will be sent to the general election in November, and the winner between those two will be Cheyenne's next mayor. Now, in city council, there are six seats up for election out of nine, and there's two seats from each ward. In Ward 1, the incumbents are Pete Laybourne and Jeff White, who are both seeking re-election. Challenging their seats are Miguel Reyes, Nathaniel Fuquan Freeman, Chris Heath, Linda Burt and Travis French. In Cheyenne City Council Ward 2, the incumbents are Tom Seagrave and Brian Cook. Tom Seagrave is seeking re-election, but Brian Cook is the only municipal candidate not seeking re-election this year. That is also a pretty crowded race uh, with Zachary Hicksonbaugh, Christopher Camargo, Kathy Emmons, Stephen D. Latham, Lynn Story Hylar, and Dennis Rafferty. And the final ward, Ward 3, the incumbents are Richard Johnson and Michelle Aldrich who are also both seeking re-election, and the only challenger is Mark Moody. In the Cheyenne City Council elections in the August primaries, two candidates are sent to the general election for the primaries. So as there are two seats available in each ward, there will be four candidates for each ward that are on the ballot in November. So the only one where the primaries don't mean as much as in Ward 3 is there are only three candidates, so they will likely all be on the ballot in November. Thanks for sticking with us as we rounded up uh, quite a few of the elections that you'll need to know about before you go to the polls this week. And be sure to tune in next week where we'll uh, round up the results of what happened. All right, I'm joined here by Ivy Seacrest and Taylor Staples and a new voice on the podcast, our summer intern, Alyssa Crutcher, who's recording with us on her last day here for her summer internship. But uh, 
Taylor, what have you got for us this week? So I just wrote a story um, on something that's happening at the library on the 20th and the 21st. It's called A Scandal in Bodgerton, which is a little play on Bridgerton and Jane Austen. It's a murder mystery party game that's sold in like a kit on Amazon. So they just grabbed that and decided to turn it into an event. But they're going to theme it all out with decor and food and all of the hosts are going to dress regally, I should say. Um but I don't know. It looks like a blast. I loved themed parties. So that's kind of why I, what I wanted to circle this back to. But I want to take us back to our childhoods and kind of reflect on themed parties that we went to or we hosted either birthday parties or other, you know, events in general. And what was your favorite? So one that's topical right now, and it's actually the last birthday party I remember having like a theme for like as a kid, you know, it was, I have a February birthday and I can't remember which year, I think I was turning eight or something, but it was during the winter Olympics. And so I had an Olympic themed birthday party and we had like a whole bunch of games and I had all my little friends over and that was quite a bit of fun. I think I had two very memorable ones, um, both Disney Channel themed. One was mine, and it was a Hannah Montana themed party. I did wear a wig. Nobody else did. <laughs> it was very itchy. Um, but it was cool. We just did karaoke. It was simple. Um, the cake was decorated with a little print. I don't really know what they do at cake stores to do that. Um, and then my friend did a high school musical themed one. Um, I actually have a DVD to it <laughs> in my house still because we did – a choreographed dance to I don't remember what song it was probably some something from the first high school musical but it was it was a blast again cake was themed high school musical decor was themed high school musical you know the cheesy stuff from party city so I don't know it was just fun There was so much joy in themed parties it's like it's like Halloween now for us but like themed parties as children yeah, I so there's a lot of fall birthdays in my personal life. So my favorite birthday parties that I've ever been to have been my best friend growing up. Her birthday was at the beginning of October. Uh, her family is Hispanic and is really, really big into Halloween. And so her birthday was always Halloween themed. And uh, her uncle would dress up as in this like hyper realistic werewolf costume. And her mom would set up these like games where you'd like be blindfolded and reach into things that felt gross and ended up being like brownies or whatever. Um, and that was always really fun and something I think everyone really looked forward to growing up. And then the best theme party I've ever pulled off was my sister's birthday is near Thanksgiving. And we, for I think it was her 16th birthday, threw like a Gilmore Girls themed party <laughs> because the revival came out around that time. So we ordered a ton of takeout and we had like these massive coffee mugs and we watched all of the revival episodes and it was like probably my proudest moment as an older sister pulling that off for her well I have two that stand out in my life I think it was my eighth birthday party um I was obsessed with Justin Bieber in elementary school as many other elementary school girls were and I no longer am but my eighth birthday party was Justin Bieber themed um and we had Justin Bieber plates cups napkins cardboard cutouts wrapping paper that sort of thing, and I think it was a slumber party, and we watched his movie, and I it might have been Never Say Never, unless there was one before that, I can't remember. It was a Justin Bieber movie that we went to see in theaters, so that was really interesting, and that's usually something that I tell people when I want them to like think I'm fun. I'm like, by the way, I have a Justin Bieber themed birthday party on my belt. But then the last themed birthday party I had is kind of similar to Noah in a way, similar to Noah's in a way. It was my 18th birthday party, and my birthday is also February February 10th. So when I turned 18, that day was also the Super Bowl. So we had it Super Bowl themed and it was at my house, but we had like football balloons and we watched the Super Bowl and then we had ordered Buffalo Wild Wings, like seven different flavors. And then we made, because it was popular at the time, a nacho table where we just covered my kitchen table and chips and cheese and all of that. It, like it, it was just my kitchen table was disgusting with nachos. So that was really cool, and I actually, I hate football. I've never watched the Super Bowl. And then my cake was a cookie cake, and it was shaped like a football, and I was like, this is so not fitting, but it's fun. Wow, 
All right, and before we sign off for this week, I just wanted to introduce someone who's been with us this summer, our summer intern, Alyssa Kretcher, who is a student at the University of Arkansas studying journalism. Uh, Alyssa, thanks for helping us out this summer. What have been some of the things that you've enjoyed being in Cheyenne the past few months? Um, I've enjoyed Cheyenne a lot. I don't know if there's anything specific I can pick out. Usually when people ask me how I felt about living in Cheyenne, I just tell them that I love it because it's so different from Arkansas. And some people would, some people that I've talked to here would say that that's um, a negative thing, but I think it's very positive. I really love it here. I love um, the weather most of the time, except for at the beginning of the summer when I was leaving for work and it was like 30 or 40 degrees in the morning. I did not like that. Um, but I just love the atmosphere here. I think it's really pretty. And then working for the Tribune Eagle has been really fun because I've I've been working for my campus newspaper for the past three and a half years, but working like actually in the field in like a, I don't want to say like a real newspaper because campus newspapers are real, but like an actual established like city or state newspaper has been really cool, really a different experience than working for a university newspaper. So I've learned a lot. And I've learned a lot about like my work ethic and what I love about journalism and, and that sort of thing. So, mm. And so has there been anything that stood out to you this summer that you've reported on? Um, kind of everything has been really fun for me just because I love writing. But something that really stood out was when we did Frontier Days coverage. Um, I wrote, I think, five or six stories during that week. And I got to go to Frontier Park for them, most of them, and experience that kind of atmosphere, which I thought was really cool. Because I've never really, last summer I visited here and I went to the rodeo just once, but I didn't really get to explore Frontier Park and go to different places. So that was really fun. And I got to try all the foods. And then one weekend I went to the rodeo with another reporter here. So that was really cool. But yeah, I just really liked that week. Great. And what's next for you? Um, I am going back to Arkansas to finish my last semester. I will be graduating in December. Um, And then after that, I will hopefully be moving back to Cheyenne either in December or April after I get married to my fiance who lives here. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Appreciate all the work you've done this summer, especially covering for me quite a few times. But that's all for this week. So I appreciate you tuning in to this week's episode of The Perch. Be sure to tune in next week as we bring you the latest news and a quick roundup of the August primaries.